Right, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's Grand Rounds with Dr. Aaron. Just for housekeeping, if anyone has any questions throughout the talk, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the chat box, and we'll just get to them at the end of the talk. Now I'd just like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Aaron is an assistant professor of otology, neuroautology, lateral skull based surgery at the Head and Neck Institute at Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic. She also serves as the Institute's diversity, equity, and inclusion director. Dr. Aaron specializes in hearing loss and tumors of the lateral skull base with passion for hearing restoration. And with that, the floor is yours, Dr. Aaron. Perfect. Um, I guess the, the camera is off, right? Just for the slides. Just want to make sure I'm not doing anything wrong. Yes. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Ksenia Aaron, and uh, as mentioned before, I'm the current clinical assistant professor here at Cleveland Clinic. And uh, today I wanted to give this lecture, with, which is titled Sounds of Progress, Transforming Perspective on Hearing Loss, because March 3rd today is actually World Hearing Day. Um, and I thought it would be fitting to give a uh, grand round stock. Uh, in terms of any full disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, some of the content in the slides were contributed by my uh, former chair at uh, Stanford, who was my mentor during my IT32 fellowship there, Dr. Robert Jackler. And as I mentioned before, today is March 3rd and it is the World Hearing Day. So I'm very excited. Helen Keller famously said, blindness separates us from things, but deafness separates us from people. Hearing loss is actually the most common sensory deficit in humans. With nearly two out of 1,000 children that are born in the United States are born with hearing loss, and of which 65% are often due to hereditary causes. And when you look as the children age, the prevalence rises in hearing loss in children to up to 15% in those between the age of six to 19 years old. Aging also contributes to a decline in function in multiple organ systems, including the inner ear. In adults, hearing loss is the most prevalent sensory deficit. One third, one out of three adults that are aged over 65 have some degree of hearing loss, and almost 50% of those over 75 years old suffer from debilitating hearing loss. So hearing loss, not only is it a significant sensory deficit, it also contributes to reduced quality of life. In children, we see that there is a delay in speech and language development. This leads to educational assistance requirement in school, as well as glade failure and social isolation. We see similar by various different aspects of it in adults. We see that adults that do not hear well are more prone to have social isolation, therefore forming depression. They do not want to go out with their partner, with their family, because too many speakers is too hard for them to hear. This leads in a way to cognitive decline. And there has been a link more recently that uh, hearing loss, any hearing loss actually contributes to progressive uh, um, and more rapid development of Alzheimer's disease. There has also has been data to show that hearing loss also reduces physical activity and in turn leads to muscular atrophy. This leads to falls and ultimately to mortality. So hearing loss is, uh, in a way, um, epidemic of loneliness. 32% of adults are at risk of dying from uh, loneliness, potentially due to hearing loss. 32% of those have rise and increased risk of stroke, and 29% have a risk of coronary artery disease, those that have depression and isolation. Hearing loss is also a global pandemic. Not only does it lead to higher healthcare costs, lower patient-physician communication, sometimes even satisfaction, and also it decreases patient compliance. Currently, in the United States alone, the cost of unaddressed hearing loss is nearly $1 trillion annually. We know that from World Health Organization, 1.5 billion people in the world have some degree of hearing loss globally, with near half a billion of them having profound hearing loss or debilitating hearing loss. 
it is projected by that by the year of 2050, there will be 2.5 billion um, global patients with hearing loss. Um, and over the next decade, those that are 85 and older will be our fastest growing population. So if we already know that one out of two people that are 75 years and older have hearing loss, now we're gonna have a, a, a true epidemic with a hundred and those of a hundred years of age and older being the fast, the second fastest growing population. Um, and only if we look globally, only 70 million hearing aids were sold in 2019. So it's definitely an unaddressed and an unmet need. But before we talk about hearing loss and kind of the reasons for it, it's very important to go over the anatomy of the ear. So here you can see the oracle, which is our ear. And when the sound enters, it enters several chambers as it travels in to provide sound. The first of them, this green one by the green bar, is the external auditory canal or outer ear. It goes and until it reaches the tympanic membrane. Between the tympanic membrane and the inner ear, we have the middle ear. And the middle ear houses our three little bones of hearing, the malleus, which connects to incus, which then connects to stapes. And it is the vibratory mechanism of the tympanic membrane, which then vibrates the little bones of hearing, then transduces the sound into the inner ear, which is the internal auditory canal also connected to it, which then sends the signal in through the nerves, that provide the balance and uh, hearing, as well as there's a facial nerve also here that then goes into the brain stem and then into the cortical area of the um, cortex of the brain that provides hearing. There are two ways in which we hear. We hear through air conduction, which is the regular way where someone says a word or there is a sound. You hear the vibration of the wave entering your ear canal, vibrating the eardrum, your bone of hearings, and then goes into the cochlea or inner ear. But the second way we actually hear is through the bone vibration, which is equally as important. It's called the bone conduction. So the vibration of the skull from receiving the vibratory mechanism of the sound bypasses the ear canal, bypasses the middle ear, and goes directly into the inner ear or the cochlea and then sends the uh, signal into the brain. So how do we test hearing in clinic? We test it with the audiology. We refer our patients usually to go to see an audiologist. And the way that we test hearing is by providing certain frequencies. Regular human can hear between 200 to 20,000 hertz or uh, uh, 20 kilohertz. And it was Henry Hertz who developed uh, the concept. And uh, in the normal audiogram, we only test between 250 to 8,000 hertz. And what we do is by varying different uh, frequencies or pitch, we increase the intensity and see at which loudness or at which decibel or the intensity level does the patient recognize the beat. So here's a standard audiogram. You can see on the left side going from low frequencies to high frequencies. And the lower we go down, the harder it is for someone to hear. 20 decibel right here, imagine a line, and higher is normal hearing. 20 decibels and lower is hearing loss. On most audiograms, right ear is represented by the red. So right is red, and blue or X is represent the left ear. So here you can see that this patient has completely normal hearing across all frequencies that have been tested. We don't only hear in beeps because the, during this test, this is when you put the headphones on and you play beeps at various frequencies and various loudness, and then the patient presses the button saying that they heard that beep. But in real world, we also recognize words. So there is another part of the hearing test where they test word recognition score. And here you can see this number. And then during that test, the audiologist plays various words like cat, bat, mat, 
And then the patient tries to guess what the word was, and then they get a percent correct score. So this is again, um, kind of the normal audiogram, low to high pitch, and the lower you go down, the louder they have to crank up the volume in order for the patient to be able to hear the sound. Again, just like I went over before, this is a normal audiogram of patient who hears completely normal on the right, the red, and the blue, the left ear. But what's important to know is that word recognition score actually is affected by this speech reception uh, area, where the majority of the syllables and vowels that we hear in um, during everyday life actually occur in this little box. The rest are actually extra sounds such as the car honk or the siren or, and so there is actually a, um, a oh, so, sorry, there is a speech banana boat. So again, between this 500 and 3000 Hertz, we have, and between 20 and 50 decibels are most of our um, letters that we hear. And the uh, upper end, we hear the fricatives, s, sh, p, p. and then the lower ones, we hear the more deeper tones, the a, ah, o, oh, u. Um, so when people start losing hearing in the in this box, this is when word recognition score usually goes down. So what are the types of hearing loss? We, we actually have two types of hearing loss. We have a conductive hearing loss. And in this, the basically the conduction of the air that travels the ear canal and middle ear and the vibration of the ossicle, something is preventing that travel of um, the conduction of sound. And so really what patient relies on more heavily then is the vibration of the skull as the sound is vibrating the skull and then travels to the inner ear. So in this, here is an example of an audiogram with a conductive hearing loss. And specifically, you were looking at the right ear here. So the brackets here represent the bone conduction, the BC. And this uh, little triangles represent the air conduction. And you can see outside of the left ear being normal, this blue line, our brackets, the red line here, which is the way the inner ear hears, because again, the bone conduction is when the, when we go back, is when the skull vibrates and bypasses the ear canal, bypasses the uh, eardrum and the little bones of hearing, and goes directly into the cochlea. So this is really how your inner ear hears. And in this person, the inner ear just fine. But what's wrong here is actually either the tympanic membrane, the ear canal, the little bones of hearing are just not vibrating very well. So the patient has a hearing loss, a, what we call an air bone gap, because there's a gap. And so what are the causes for conductive hearing loss? Well, there are various ones. Like I said, something might be blocking the ear canal. In kids, it might be an ear bead or whatever they tended to stuff into their ear. In adults, it's more common earwax. Other causes can be eardrum perforation, so the uh, vibration of the tympanic membrane is not normal. Um, middle ear fluid or effusion or pus, discontinuation of a secular chain, as well as uh, various middle ear tumors or growth such as cholesteatoma. And we also have a sensory neural hearing loss. So in that step of hearing loss, the air and bone conduction actually conducting together, but the only thing in the sensory neural component, in the component of the, the, the cochlea or the nerve of hearing or the circuitry that goes into the auditory cortex is interrupted. And so when we think about our cochlea, it's a two and a half snail shaped turn that has a tonotopic kind of distribution of the frequencies along it. And within it, we have the organ of Cordy that has our three rows of outer hair cells, one row of inner hair cells, and then it sends the signal through the nerve, then into the cochlear nucleus, and then into the auditory cortex. And so for example, here, we, well, like I said before, cochlea is a very tonotopic distribution of sound. At the base, we have the high frequency sound, 20,000 hertz, whereas at the apex, we have the low frequency sounds, the 200 hertz. So here's an example of low frequency. So 
So it travels all the way to the apex. Whereas here, when you have a higher frequency sound, it just stimulates the low or the base. And then sensorineural hearing, this is an example. For example, the right ear in this patient is completely normal, but the left ear has a profound hearing loss. So what are the common causes of hearing loss? Noise exposure, one of the common causes, such as recreation, shooting, or factory working, occupational, um, and going to a rock concerts. Other common causes is autotoxic medications, serial, uh, certain antibiotics like aminoglycosides, um, chemotherapeutic like cisplatin, carboplatin, loop diuretics, anti-malaria drugs, and certain NSAIDs. Additional causes include tumors within the uh, nerve of hearing or even the ear canal like squamous cell carcinoma that can obstruct and cause hearing loss. Uh, genetics is the most common cause, uh, is one of the more common causes in children hereditary. Uh, sudden hearing loss, we see cases as well as a trauma. So with hearing loss, what usually happens at least with age or noise-induced hearing loss, there's usually um, higher frequencies or the ones that are by the base of the cochlea get affected first. And as the hearing loss progresses and there is a drop in this, it's called a downsloping high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, the word recognition score starts to also decline as there is a decline in this uh, speech reception box. So as more they more progress, the word recognition starts dropping more. And it's about uh, hearing um, can be amplified normally with the devices like hearing aids up to when the word recognition score reaches 60%. When it's below 60%, Hearing aids are actually not very good because at this point, the patient is basically guessing more than 40% of the information that they're presented. So although they're being, the hearing aid might provide a lot of amplification and loudness, the, the words are still gibberish. So it's very hard for them to understand. So what are the available current treatment strategies that we have? Well, like as I mentioned before, some of our hearing loss can be amplified with a hearing aid, and it's the most natural way to kind of increase the ability to hear. But it's uh, it's to a degree, this is, uh, like I said, there is a limitation. When word recognition drops below a certain percentage, it's hard to amplify it with a hearing aid. Other ways we can amplify hearing is through, it's called bone conductive device, where a little implant is implanted into the bone, and actually this... Um, uh, it, it's almost like an external processor of a hearing aid, uh, then stimulates, vibrates the skull, and through bone conduction, it then sends information to the inner ear, bypassing the ear canal. This is very common with kids, like with kids with oral atresia, uh, with patients that cannot tolerate uh, anything in their ears, sudden sensory neural hearing loss will uh, come and implant them. But when hearing aid uh, cannot provide substantial uh, benefit, and even sometimes the bone conductive device, then we have other implantable devices such as cochlear device, which bypasses the external auditory canal, the middle ear, and the device goes directly into the cochlea to stimulate the nerve that goes then and sends the information to the brain. And sometimes we also have uh, cases where the cochlea itself is malformed, a cochlear aplasia, or the nerve is either transected during surgery or the tumor, um, and so we have no cochlear nerve, we have no cochlea, and in those cases, we actually uh, put on an auditory brainstem implant, which goes in by the brainstem, by the cochlear nucleus, and the lateral fourth ventricle. So let's just talk about the hearing restoration. So hearing aids is the most common type of amplification. It amplifies natural sound acoustically and just basically by raising volume in the um, frequencies that patients cannot hear. But the only problem is that, for example, if we look at patients when they cannot see, once you start having issues seeing, you go get glasses. Almost all those that need eyeglasses or contacts go and obtain them. But for those that have hearing loss, only one in every four adults who could benefit from hearing aid actually get it. So there are actually drivers of this limited hearing aid adoption. One is it still carries a stigma to a degree. Another one, majority of hearing aids are actually not covered by insurance, and so it's out-of-the-pocket cost. 
And third, there is a degree of repetition that it has for performance. So how do we get people to care about their caring health? Well, one is we have to overcome the stigma. With eyeglasses, there's really no stigma. Yes, it might block your face or alter your appearance slightly, but in a way it connotes intelligence. It's a fashion statement, right? Whereas as hearing devices um, have long carried a very big stigma, it's often associated with elderly people. So old age, it suggests diminished mental capacity and to a degree, it was a stereotype that deaf meant dumb. So how do we remove the stigma? Well, one way is we have to remember our first generation devices. Ear trumpet was actually the first um, type of a hearing assisted device back in 17th century. You remember your cell phones back when they first came out? And this was a common kind of first um, generation hearing. And this is why a lot of patients that initially were wearing hearing aids saw it as a stigma, as a deficit. But now consumer earphones are becoming a badge of technological sophistication and almost honor, right? A majority of people that walk around now have something in their ear or are listening with something in their ear. There's also been celebrity endorsements such as David Beckham that um, uh, proudly kind of uh, sh showcased off his hearing amplification device or listening device. And also more recently, we have seen uh, within the pediatric world that there have been more inclusive or representative toys such as the Barbie or the American doll that has uh, hearing assisted devices uh, proudly kind of showing. So the stigma of wearing an ear device is rapidly waning, especially more recently and modern devices are more subtle. You can see in this gentleman, there's only a very thin plastic tubing that goes behind his ear. And on the side, if you look on the side of his head, you can't really see the uh, receiver. Only when he really pulls his ear back, do you see the little box behind? And this can be color match, so it can be skin color, black color. It really, there's variations in what you can have. So how do we get people to afford hearing health? The average price in the US of eyeglasses that will provide your vision for both eyes is about $350. Whereas for hearing aids, it's about $4,800 for both ears to be amplified. It goes upwards of six to $9,000. So it is really costly, especially when insurance doesn't cover it. And hearing aid economics, of when you look at 2020, while wholesale average of a hearing aid uh, per, uh, per hearing aid is about 770 and 1,540 per pair, the retail average of what it is being sold for is, as you can see, 312% kind of markup ratio, only movie theater popcorn beats that. So it, it is a very expensive um, gadget to have, and there's a lot of people that will not be able to afford it. So how do we overcome hearing aid adaptation obstacles? Well, one way is the recent over-the-counter revolution that happened. FDA, um, in, in 2017, there was a proposal that hearing aids should become over-the-counter, that you didn't have to go into the medical provider to get a prescription and then go to the audiologist to get fitted only to pay several thousand dollars. They wanted to open it to the market. And so in 2022, FDA finally approved um, over-the-counter hearing aids. The requirements is that it would eliminate uh, a requirement for a licensed professional, such as myself, to see someone and give them a prescription for a hearing aid. Um, and it could be done over-the-counter with self-fit, usually via smartphone. It may necessitate visits for customization, programming, cleaning, or repair, but um, there are ways to go about it. And so now, if you look at kind of the available uh, devices out there, you can get a good pair for about $800. And low at the end market from Amazon, you can find ranging anywhere from $99 to $300, and they're still fairly small. And yes, you can find a pair for under $20. Yes, they look more primitive, 
but nevertheless, it is available. It is available as a, an assistive device to kind of uh, improve your hearing. And there, because of the availability of smartphones almost in everyone's hand now, there are now apps that uh, allow you to do self-fitting. You also have a virtual guided fitting uh, um, for your hearing aid, as well as you can have an in-person service or telehealth audiology. And in-person services are offered through places like Costco, Walmart. So there's definitely other places that can be where a patient can go, not necessarily in the uh, audiology office. But nevertheless, for our majority of patient population that need hearing aids, at least in the, the aging population, those 65 and over, only 61% of them as of the uh, year 2021 had a smartphone. And many, even with the smartphones, could not manage fitting a hearing aid via the app. So they had to have an in-office um, visit uh, with a provider. And common issues that arise, which cannot be handled remotely or by self, is usually hearing aids are fitted. Uh, everyone's ear canal is different, and therefore not every shoe fits the same ear, so to say, right? So um, hearing aid uh, molding uh, has to be customized. And this is where seeing an audiology really helps. Um, so fitting to maximize comfort, you might need to see an audiologist or the patient. Um, also hearing aid blocks the earwax from leaving more easily. And it's not uncommon for patients with hearing aids to build up earwax. So that becomes a problem. So not now the patient, while they have a hearing aid, is amplifying basically the earwax, not their eardrum. And furthermore, it needs to be cleaned, where it is usually done in office by the audiologist. So not only that, if you look at the ratings of some of the hearing aids online, some patient, uh, some patients that have tried it really feel like it has limited capabilities or and a lot of the time stems from suboptimal fitting. And some of it is from the digital technology itself. So this, in a way, then reinforces the bias that hearing aids don't help. And so outside of hearing aid, like I mentioned before, there we have the osseointegrative device, which is the bone anchor device, the Baja Ponto or Ossea. There's two types. There is one that gets implanted transcutaneously where the little screw and, uh, and the post, uh, basically there's a hole that's made through the skin and it gets implanted into the bone. Oh, sorry. And then this is just gets clicked on onto the abutment that you see sticking out here or there's a fully subcutaneous one where the patient just wears a magnet. And again, the, the way that this device works is through vibration of the skull, bypassing the ear canal, bypassing anything sitting within the ear canal and the need to obstruct the ear canal with a hearing aid. And so remember when I talked about that once the word recognition score drops below 60%, so in this patient's audiogram, the not only do they have a downsloping profound hearing loss in the high frequencies, but their also word recognition score is 46 for the right ear and 42 for the left ear, meaning they're basically guessing 60% of the things that is being said to them. In this setting, hearing aid will not help. So this is when we consider hearing restoration through a cochlear implant. A cochlear implant is a device that gets, uh, there are two components. One is the visual that most patients see is the external processor. Now they can then connect it through a magnet to the internal device that which is implanted. It uh, goes uh, subcutaneously under the skin and the muscle, uh, kind of in this area, in this posterior area. And then the implant gets threaded into the cochlea. And usually it happens because the hair cells, the little hair cells in the cochlea die with um, either ex exposure to noise, genetic predisposition or various other causes. And so what the cochlear implant does is directly stimulates the modulus where the nerve endings of the cochlear nerve come in. And so it basically directly stimulates the nerve. 
and then this uh, stimulus then sends the information into the uh, brainstem and to the auditory cortex. So, but the difference between a hearing aid, the way that patients hear with a hearing aid versus with a cochlear implant, a cochlear implant is an electromechanical stimulation. It's not a natural acoustic hearing. So a lot of the times when patients come in to see me and ask, well, what am I going to hear? And I cannot provide, tell them exactly what they're going to hear because I've never heard it personally. Well, I've done studies with simulation of what might be heard with a cochlear implant, but I still, I do not have a cochlear implant myself. But what my patients that receive it say initially, it sounds more tinny, more electromechanic-like, chipmunk-like almost, or Mickey Mouse-like. But as they progress in their adaptation and as the brain gets more used to hearing with the implant, a lot of the sounds start to normalize and start to fuse with the contralateral ear, which still hears acoustically and kind of the brain fuses the two together and more becomes more natural and more clear. Um, at current, uh, in, the, in, in 2019, more than 200,000 uh, cochlear implants have been done in the US um, with, uh, I believe, 60 or 70,000 of those being children with more than 700,000 globally that received a uh, cochlear implant. But if we look at patients that actually need a cochlear implant that are struggling with hearing aid, but just are not either aware of the technology, or again, it comes back down to the, you know, the stigma, because this is much larger now than the hearing aid that we currently have. That only we believe that we only implanted only 5% of those that actually need a cochlear implant have been implanted. So there is a really large need to capture this patient population to provide them with meaningful hearing and ability to kind of function in the world. So um, now we talked about devices that either amplify it or stimulate it. But again, as mentioned before, what if a patient is born without a cochlear, so there is no place to put a cochlear device in, or without a cochlear nerve, or there is it was transected during surgery or the tumor. There are certain um, disease processes uh, like an NF2, neurofibromatosis type 2, which leads to hearing loss and sometimes the um, nerve involvement and the tumor resection or the gamma knife treatment make the nerve um, non-usable. So at that point, we do auditory brainstem implant. And this is an implant uh, which is fairly similar on the outside of how it looks um, in terms of the external processor and even the internal processor except the electrode pad. This is an electro pad that gets placed into the fourth lateral ventricle by the cochlear nucleus that directly stimulates uh, the cochlear nucleus and then sends the signal to the auditory cortex. The only um, kind of downside to the auditory brainstem implants. We do not have as great of an outcome with auditory brainstem implants as we do with cochlear implants. Um, the best uh, that we have been able to achieve in some studies is open set um, word recognition. So patients are able to recognize words in an open set speech. Some are able to recognize uh, some words on telephone, but it's not kind of like the 90% to 100% word recognition scores with normal pure and tone averages. So it also is an electromechanical stimulation and um, more than uh, 1,400 implants have been implanted worldwide. So what uh, I've been talking about various kind of uh, hearing uh, devices, implantable treatments. What about the non-device um, treatments? Well, hearing loss is a major, like I said, unmet medical need. And the challenges when studying the potential of non-implantable devices or treatment options for hearing loss is that for one is we can't see cells in the human inner ear. It's very, very deep in a temporal bone, which is a very solid bone. So you can't image it on an MRI level. You just kind of see the structure of the cochlea, but not on the kind of what you would see in animal models on the hair cell level. Also, uh, currently, we really lack biological and medical therapy that are FDA approved for hearing restoration, uh, unlike the ophthalmology world where the eye is very accessible and therefore their gene therapy studies have been very on the forefront and already kind of more than 10 year plus with success in gene therapy. 
hearing restoration therapy with um, various biologicals or uh, gene therapy, or um, they're still lacking behind. And thirdly, we just lack ability to take part of the inner ear to study it, at least from humans. Um, although recently I have through Stanford when I was there, or have worked on a project where I was able to um, procure inner ear tissue to study kind of from fresh, um, uh, it's not really from patient, but from a donor that would undergo uh, kidney and liver transplant. And when the transplant team was uh, harvest, uh, procuring the organs, I would also collect the tissue to study the inner ear. But the current mainstream, uh, so when a patient comes in and they say, well, I have a sensory neural hearing loss, it's suddenly current. Really, the mainstay treatment that we have to restore some form of hearing with any medicine is steroids. We either provide them with oral steroid taper, usually 60 milligrams taper down over two uh, weeks, or intratympanic steroids. That is kind of our workhorse. Um, there's, of course, like I said before, um, our inner ear, which is fairly inaccessible to study and to biopsy uh, as it ages or whatever genetic causes or hearing um, kind of noise-induced causes, the hair cells start to die off. And so the target really is this organ of 40 for the drug therapeutics. So the current treatment uh, strategies that are under investigations so include the stem cell therapy, um, gene therapy, CRISP-Cas9, and various other vectors, as well as molecular therapy, various molecular therapy. And we actually, this year, we're very fortunate. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we see the first uh, successful gene therapy and uh, for A to one gene, one of the more common genes for hearing loss in children, to be able to restore hearing in the child. So what is the future of hearing? Well, as wearable ear devices are becoming more ubiquitous feature of modern life, they are actually becoming more common than wearing a wristwatch, right? And we're now in an era where we wear a lot of biosensors or glasses, right? Google glasses, the headsets, uh, watch, everything is smart, smart this, smart that, smart that, that tracks you. So with this intelligent ecosystem of digital devices, we can connect our hearing devices to a lot of sources of kind of sound awareness. So a lot of my patients with either hearing aid or cochlear implants are able to connect themselves to computer, to smartphone, to television. They actually can watch a TV in silence, so to say, as if they're wearing a headphone and being streamed directly to their uh, hearing aid or cochlear implant. The same thing with picking up phones. They can also set up their wearables to you know, be alar um, aware when the fire alarm goes off or it can be even connected through Bluetooth through, uh, to smart glasses. Um, and with that, um, it, we are highly connected in a multifunctional consumer device in a way. It provides information, entertainment, uh, translation. There are devices now that you can just listen and it translates to you. And so you can have your hearing aid translate to you in real time. Right, and also protects from noise. There is a certain um, a certain um, uh, decibel, the hearing, and it actually a, a kind of constricts the sound and not allows certain decibels to enter. So it's a noise protection. And then we can connect other biometrics monitoring such as pulse oximetry. We can measure the temperature through it or this. So it can all be available on your smartphone all by the wearable device through a hearing aid. So the future of hearing restoration is truly bright, but as kind of before improving in all that we have, it is important for us as providers to create awareness and awareness both, and really truly starts with us, with providers, especially in the kind of just the general medical fields. When you're seeing a patient, you're seeing that they're struggling to hear uh, or you notice that someone mentioned that, you know, uh, they brought in their father or mother and they're saying that they're struggling to hear. It's recognizing when to refer their patients and family members for evaluation or hearing um, evaluation. You can also suggest that there are various at-home apps that they can do for screening and just to screen their hearing and to see if they do have some degree of hearing loss 
that would necessitate going into the office for further evaluation. But I think what is also important is actually creating screening programs. Children currently are screened through their school, but we do not have that for adults. Unless a patient recognizes that they have a hearing loss, they're not recommended, well, let's do a screening uh, hearing uh, test, let's say at the age of 40 or at 50 or at 60, right? So I think creating progress screening programs as part of yearly physical would be um, instrumental in capturing and assuring that the world uh, of patients or the patients that are struggling to hear really are able to hear. So with that, I thank you and I will take any questions. Thank you so much for speaking tonight, Dr. Aaron. I really appreciated the detail and the physiology. It was really an excellent refresher and review and a very fitting lecture for today as World Hearing Day. So now we'll just open up the floor to any questions. So any of the attendees, please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens and we'll both stick around for a few minutes for any questions if anybody has. Is the question, uh, if there is a um, time to talk to me specifically? Yeah, we can definitely chat outside. There is a question here. Um, if you can comment on the sensation of tinnitus. Yes, so tinnitus, tinnitus, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, um, is a very interesting uh, kind of pathophysiology. It actually happens for various reasons the most common being hearing loss. So what happens is when hearing loss happens and then there are certain frequencies that the brain can no longer hear, there's almost like miswiring um, that happens and the brain creates its own noise in a certain frequency or, sh or whatever the what we call the tinnitus is that patient experiences. Um, but tinnitus does not only come from hearing loss. There are other causes such as, for example, so the ear is innervated by many nerves, five branches um, to be more direct. Some of them run through the TMJ joint. So some people with TMJ issues and grinding and bruxism and impingement of that nerve actually can have tinnitus. Uh, also, there is a nerve that exits the spine and the C1, C2 level and then innervate, runs to innervate the ear and compression of that nerve or impingement in patients with cervical spine issues can have cervicogenic tinnitus, right? So uh, there are various causes for tinnitus and tinnitus is not only just a tone where you see, you can hear like a noise, it can also be pulsatile tinnitus where patients hear whooshing more or their own heartbeat. And that has its own various kind of degree of uh, pathophysiology behind it and the reasons behind it. So tinnitus is not a, a one and done, but in patients that do have tinnitus due to hearing loss, usually amplifying hearing, so wearing hearing aids, actually suppresses tinnitus. Or patients that have a debilitating hearing loss and are cochlear implants, there is actually uh, data to suggest that cochlear implants and those that qualify is able to suppress tinnitus in 70 to 80% of patients when the hearing is restored. There's another question here. Would you recommend genetic testing for someone with hearing loss since age two and would it ever impact treatment management in the future? So uh, honestly, in children, I do recommend um, genetic screening because um, they are the earlier, they're, even though there are usually what we call postlingual hearing loss, and if it's a sensory neural hearing loss, the uh, hearing loss of the inner ear and not conductive from eardrum or cerumen or whatever other, maybe even ossicle malformation, um, if it's purely sensory neural, then I do recommend that um, young patients get screened because um, genetic hearing loss is not only kind of pre-lingual or intrauterine. There is many genetic causes for post-lingual kind of delayed uh, hearing loss. And yes, and especially now in the age of um, gene therapy, the potential of gene therapy, 
Yes, I, I do think, I think the trial that just came out out of um, Boston with um, collaboration through China uh, implanted, I believe their age group was somewhere five-year-olds. And so there is definitely potential therapy available, especially if it's in a genetic mutation uh, that is common and that is currently undergoing clinical trials. And one more question. Can you clarify which issue, either problems with air conduction or problems with bone conduction, that results in sensory neural hearing loss? So the sensory neural hearing loss, it's actually not a problem with bone or air conduction. So the air enters the ear canal because it's clean, vibrates the eardrum, vibrates the little bones of hearing, reaches the cochlea, and the bone conduction also kind of vibrates the skull, reaches the cochlea, but when it reaches the cochlea, the cochlea itself or the inner ear is not working very well. The sensory neural, the neural component, the, the hair cells within the cochlea are either, you know, have some of them died or the nerve endings, uh, the nerve itself is uh, been transected or absent. They're, or like there's something with the cortical uh, cortex or the uh, cochlear nucleus. So it's within the neural component. It's not the bone or the air conduction. So actually, when you look at the audiogram, if you look at the those sensory neural when the, the the tip, the high frequency was dropping down, in those, you, you only saw one line. And one line, because the air conduction and bone conduction are actually exactly the same. Because what you hear through the ear canal is exactly the same that the bone is vibrating. But when it all reaches the cochlea, that is where the problem is. <clears throat> So yeah, when the problem is with air conduction, that is when there is a conductive hearing loss because the air cannot pass through the ear canal, cannot pass through the middle ear, something is obstructing it. But bone conduction, there's really truly no, um, so to say, um, no limit to the bone conduction. Yeah, we our skull vibrates and it even crosses over through vibration to the other inner ear. So when the problem is air conduction, so when the problem is air conduction, we refer to it as the air bone gap. We refer to it as conductive hearing loss. The conduction of air is not properly transduced. And when both air and bone conduction uh, are the same, acting the same, and then they reach the inner ear and the inner ear is not working well or the nerve, that's the sensory neural hearing loss. I hope that clarified it. I'm sorry if it was confusing. All right, thank you so much for this lecture. It was very informative and thank you for coming on tonight to speak to everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Have a good night.